ability. So um, the lecture will be recorded from, from now. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to a special guest lecture uh, today. Um, the lecture was organized by the Serbian Association of Earthquake Engineering, SUSI. The whole uh, presentation and uh, introduction will be in English because our guest is Professor Paulat Gulkan. Uh, currently a professor uh, of uh, uh, civil, civil engineering at the uh, Bashkent University in Ankara, Turkey. And um, he, uh, he, the topic of the presentation performance limits for structural walls. I would just like to say, my name is Svetlana Berzev. Most of you know me. I'm a president of the Serbian Association of Earthquake Engineering. And um, uh, Professor would like to say a few words about Professor Gulkan. Uh, all of you have received the announcement, so are familiar with, uh, um, I hope you read, a uh, long uh, um, and uh, really uh, comprehensive uh, uh, overview of Professor Gulkan's career and achievements. Uh, he has been a long-term uh, professor most of his career. He was a professor at uh, Middle East Technical University in Ankara. Turkey and upon his retirement from, from that university, he's continued to teach. He uh, uh, has a passion for teaching and sharing his experience. So he's a professor at another university, also in Ankara. Uh, professor Gulkan has a long uh, uh, career, academic career, uh, both in, uh, he was educated in uh, US and uh, was also registered professional engineer in California and has lots of uh, strong ties with uh, American uh, colleagues and universities. He also served as a member of the board of directors at Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. He was a editor-in-chief of Earthquake Spectra, one of the leading um, journals in earthquake engineering, and uh, was the president of International Association of Earthquake Engineering, IEE, as you uh, know, um, SUSI Serbian Association of Earthquake Engineering is a member of uh, International Association of Earthquake Engineering and in fact Professor Gulkan was uh, assisting us with uh, advice when uh, they, we formed this association. Uh, he has published uh, numerous uh, papers and um, made uh, significant scientific contributions and uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, I had opportunity to work with him on, uh, as he was one of the founding uh, members also of the World Housing Encyclopedia uh, project of their uh, ERI, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and has always been uh, very out outgoing in sharing his experience. Of course, he was uh, has been very involved in Turkey after the earthquakes in 1999 and other earthquakes and has a very rich experience in uh, post earthquake, uh, um, I would say rehabilitation issues uh, associated with before and after the earthquakes in a country like Turkey, which has very high seismic hazard and uh, occurrence of earthquake events. So with that, it's real pleasure uh, to, um, uh, to ask Professor Gulkan to start with the lecture. And I'm really sorry that this lecture is virtual, that he's not our guest in Belgrade, but we will have to uh, do that uh, as soon as the situation uh, permits. So uh, Paula, please uh, start. And, um, and uh, during the lecture, just rules, uh, everybody will be muted after the lecture, uh, which will be about 50 minutes. There will be opportunity for questions and answers, and then uh, I, you can use audio uh, to ask questions. And we have Nikola Blagojevic in uh, Zurich uh, at TH, who is helping us and is also co-chairing co co this event uh, at the background. Thank you, Nikola, and Paula, please start. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Svetlana, for these gracious words um, during the introduction. Uh, I really look upon this seminar, this talk, as an opportunity, as an excuse, really, for me to uh, reconnect with the friends and colleagues and people who may remember me in in Serbia and other republics of the former Yugoslav uh, Republic. So the, the excuse is this topic, 
but the uh, the depth that you may or may not be uh, uh, associated with the subject matter is really a, is really not all that important. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to connect professionally, and I'm very grateful for this. And I have already seen uh, faces uh, that I recognize in the in the um, gallery of viewers. Now I'll be talking about the performance limits for structural walls, and let me summarize what this talk is all about. I think uh, that there is ample evidence that the performance descriptions that are beginning to creep and become part of the newer versions of the seismic codes in many countries. And the attributes that are connected with those descriptions are not necessarily in good agreement. And much work still needs to be done in that, in that regard. Uh, the rest of the talk is really an embellishment of this short summary. So uh, let, me, let me begin. But before I begin, have you ever wondered why you chose this particular profession, this particular job over any other job that you could have selected when you were 18 or 19? Why did you turn out to be structural engineers or, structure or civil engineers or earthquake engineers or engineers of any kind, even though we may have members in the audience who are not engineers also? Why did you choose this job? The reason I claim is that you did not have any guidance. Well, Liam, 30 years too late, here's my guidance to you. Selecting the right job would be much easier now if you had met me at the beginning of your career. If you have reasonable amount of mathematical skills, and if you like solving problems, then these two characteristics would lead you to a very successful career as an engineer. Don't you agree? We work with math, mechanics, and that sort of thing, we solve problems. And that's why we have become engineers, not necessarily only civil engineers, but any other kind of engineer as well. But of course, not everybody is born the same way. We're all different. Therefore, if you are born with associating and communicating well with other people, then, and if you like solving problems as well, the right job for you would have been to become a manager. That's where you would excel best. If you, in addition to dealing with people, if you like hitting the bottle frequently, then your ideal job would have been to become a salesman because that's, you know, that's where you can excel. Well, if you have math skills and if you happen to have the obsessive compulsive disorder, and you may have seen people who suffer from this but are not aware of it, then your job would have been best to become an accountant. Now, two gaps remain. If you are obsessive compulsive, and if you have no pity on anyone, no mercy, then your best job would have been in the human resources department of wherever you, you work, because you need to, uh, to rebuke people frequently, you need to fire people, as well as perhaps sometimes also to hire them. So human resources would have been ideal for you. But if you are heartless, and if you like to drink, there's only one job for you, and only one job, that's to become a lawyer. 
Now, with this guidance, I hope that you can, you will pass this on to your children so that they end up in the right job when they grow up. Now the subject matter will deal with, uh, with walls. And I will really go into this in a divergent fashion. Uh, this is a picture that I took 20 years ago, maybe even more, in the city of Erzincan, which was hit by a major earthquake in 1939, uh, 7.9, which devastated the city and, uh, and, and became synonymous with the earthquake hazard that exists in my country. Now, the same city was, uh, was struck by another six point, magnitude 6.8 event in 1992. And uh, during the course of our many visits to that city in, in retrofitting and, 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 and strengthening buildings, school buildings, uh, I took this picture. And th this is an ideal example of the principle that common sense is not very common. Look at the wall at the end. Perfect, right? You would like to reduce the drift. Uh, the interstory drift and the wall is the best mechanism to achieve that. However, the designer forgot to insert the wall at the point where it's needed most, the ground level, where we only have these skinny columns. When you look in greater detail at the same picture, you can see uh, weak columns and what appear to be strong beams. Again, a violation of the principle uh, that should be obeyed when designing reinforced concrete buildings. So uh, walls, if they are fully made, fully detailed and placed in the proper locations are wonderful mechanisms for preventing collapses, for preventing excessive damage and so on. But in the wrong hands, they can be lethal as you see here. And in fact, in, in Erzincan, 1992, this was a frequently encountered scene on the streets, the column mechanism, the pancaking of buildings. So that practice must have been more widely available, more widely encountered in Erzincan, at least until then. The reason for this was uh, there, there were only a few companies, a few firms in the city that designed buildings. And one of them was owned and operated by a mechanical engineer rather than a civil engineer. It would have been tragic if that earthquake had happened during a regular weekday instead of um, Friday evening. This building did not collapse, but it could have. It had, again, all of the sins of a building that sits like a prey to ground shaking. Weak columns, nothing but frame, moment resisting or otherwise. It did not collapse. And later on, when we retrofitted the building quickly, the only mechanism, the only remedy that we could bring up was to insert these uh, shear walls in both directions at ample quantities to even preclude the possibility of mechanisms forming in the columns in the future. The reason why we needed to act quickly was that the earthquake happened in March the government insisted that these schools should be opened in September. Not much time to do anything else. So we said, we'll do it the good old way, put in these walls. The expense was horrible, but money was no problem. The social benefit was greater than the physical expenses associated with this. Now, let me summarize once more what I will be talking to you about. I'll be talking to you about the performance limits. There are different ways of formulating the performance limits and the response of reinforced concrete elements at local, 
element level and system level, the global level, and what the dichotomy of the specifications at both levels sometimes can be. One of them can contradict the other. And we have ample uh, evidence of this, both observational and theoretical. A few tests are worth looking at in greater detail. And the range of parameters that control the way in which building structural systems will behave under strong ground motions. And finally, a synthesis of the observations, the calculations, and the implications of the calculations for perhaps guidelines or regulations or even code provisions. Now, my impression with performance limits uh, in structural walls comes from the interest that was generated in my experience in cities like Erzincan and many other cities. Unfortunately, the, the countrywide response of reinforced concrete buildings to earthquakes has been dismal, has been very poor. And uh, you know, putting the right requirements in the regulations does not always work because there's always a human element in the way design is completed and, and, and the, the building delivery process gives those buildings to the public to use. It's not always rational and mistakes, errors, and uh, negligences always take place. So uh, nonlinear structural analysis, of course, is implied in all of these comments. Unless you do a nonlinear analysis, there is no direct connection between damage and performance and, and uh, the, the final product, the building that you have created. Now, um, <clears throat> The revisions that have taken place in my country during the last 10 years or 15 years have tended to emphasize and bring to the forefront strain limits as indicators of performance. And I think that strain limits are the worst indicators of performance because they they cannot be computed reliably. They are quickly changing variables, parameters. They're not stable. And to hope that you can calculate successfully strain anywhere in a component or much less in a structural system, in my mind is, uh, is something that is unfairly and un un unjustly optimistic. We should stay away from that and lean towards more global, less rapidly varying parameters. And these can be drifts or rotations and uh, measures of that kind. They are a much more reliable way to go. Now, in spite of the wealth of experimental evidence in the way structural walls behave, it still does not cover the full range of possible sizes and shapes and configurations and seismic environments where we can find walls. Um, the experimental database is necessarily short. What we should do is to examine it carefully and to deduce, to derive conclusions from that to incorporate into our codified requirements. And my preference, as opposed to the existing regulation in my country, is to emphasize the global indicators rather than the local indicators of that. This statement is motivated by the repeated disappointment, this if you like of our efforts to predict local strains. And of course, uh, there are those in the audience I know who are more familiar with this experiment that was conducted at the University of California, San Diego on the full size 
um, shaking table there, a seven-story building that was shaken very strongly, and all kinds of measurements were made in in in, in this in this system. And there was a a, a round robin contest that followed this. And of course, Pojadar will, will, will were you involved, Pojadar, with this? Just yeah, no, no, not this, but uh, my colleague Marius Panayoto actually did these seven story frame I tests. See. No, I was not involved in that. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, you know, the, the, the round robin contest, the open contest, takes the form of, well, here's the structure, here's the material properties, here the, here's the foundation for this, here's the ground motion that we fed into it. Now you tell me what drift will take place during that ground motion at that level, what strain will take place at this particular element at that uh, ground level, uh, what the overturning moment was, what the other parameters of interest were that structural engineers deal with. So we know the input, we know the characteristics of the system. Your job is to use the tools of structural analysis, nonlinear analysis, and all of that to come up with the answers to this. Well, the exercise was a sobering experience. People were able to estimate to back calculate the quantities of interest. But the global measures were more successfully back calculated and estimated than the local measures. The curvatures, they're always a headache to calculate successfully. We can do this analytically, we can do this to any degree of detail, but to compare it with the actual animal is not all that easy. And the same goes for the strains that, of course, are the basis of the curvatures and so on. So that was a, um, an experience that uh, taught many people humility. And the teams that entered this round robin contest were not the practices of the regular kind of structural engineers. These, these people were experienced researchers. They had both a very strong basis in analytical procedures. They had experience from experiments. So they were not the regular batch of whatever the, you know, the regular engineers were. And yet we write the codes, we write the regulations for the profession, not for the, uh, the best qualified members of that. Now the component performance has been defined over the years. Uh, beginning with uh, uh, the uh, the FEMA 356, the AAC 41, uh, and various codes, including the Eurocode uh, 8, Part 8, and the Turkish regulation. Now, the definitions, the phrases that are applied to the performance ranges, of course, take different uh, words on them. Immediate occupancy or um, minimum damage as the Turkish seismic regulation for buildings that was um, announced last year or two years ago uh, is, is somewhere here. There is really no precise definition for this other than the ones that I will mention in just a moment. And the, the, and, uh, the damage limit may or may not begin at the point of yielding going slightly beyond that will still not be a tragic event. So immediate occupancy is by implication meant something of this range. And the damage control range is from the immediate occupancy level to what is known as the um, life safety level, which is somewhere over here. Life safety is, uh, uh, or safety, <clears throat> Um, structural damage, life safety or safety limit, all refer more or less to the same range of behavior at the component level. And of course, when you come to here, where we have the range, the end of the range of desirable behavior, you can be talking about collapse prevention, 
uh, the collapse limit or the ultimate uh, capacity and so on. So, and this is the limited safety range. As soon as the system, the component or the system begins to lose its capacity to carry any further uh, load or effect, then we call that, well, this is it. This is the point to which we can dare to go. And uh, the life safety is usually taken, again, by implication mostly, to, um, to be about 75% of this. So the various phrases, the various um, adjectives that are applied are reflected more or less by this single slide that I have talked to you about. Now, the fact that these are qualitative measures, qualitative descriptions of damage, of course, don't eliminate the need to become, to be more precise in terms of the numbers that describe these limits. Now, uh, the last revision of AC41, uh, AC41 takes the option, takes the path of defining these limits by member and rotations and immediate occupancy, limited safety and collapse prevention, uh, limits of rotations at the ends of reinforced concrete elements are reflected here. Two parameters are immediately apparent here. One of them is the existing axial load on the element, which of course, the higher the axial load, the less is likely to be the ductility of that element. The other one is the amount of shear that exists in the element then you can quantify that by the usual measure of the, of, of the shear effect by the normalized shear and whether or not the element has confined boundaries or not. Anyway, the limits take these numbers on themselves. And this revision was uh, published in 2008, 2009, some, somewhere around there. And I think that ASC 41, in spite of the revisions that have been effected in them, um, in the ASC 41 17 issue of the code, more or less maintain the same limits. Uh, Eurocode uh, defines these by limiting rotations. And those rotations are expressed uh, by these complicated looking and complicated equations corresponding to damage limitation, near collapse, and the, the ultimate rotation of these quantities. And of course, when you look at these equations with their glorious exactness, but these powers attached to the various parameters, you can quickly recognize the curve fitting regression effort that has gone into them. What people have done is to take a whole library of experimental results with their measurements, and they have analyzed them and fit these curves, these expressions that correspond to the various stages of damage in them. The question remains open, however, whether these will be applicable in every single case or will they be limited to a small part of the universe? My opinion is that the experimental database does not cover the universe. So we should use these equations with a great deal of skepticism. The Turkish seismic regulation is the most optimistic of all of them. Uh, mind you, I was a member of the committee that drafted the regulation. But I was also at the same time, one of its most vocal critics. But there's ultimately at the end of the day, a committee that drafts these requirements. And a committee is operated by uh, the majority rule. If enough hands are raised in defense of these strain limits for the concrete and the steel, then that's the law. And the joke in this regard, of course, is that a camel is really a horse that was designed by a committee. They began with the intention of coming up with a horse, but every voice, every opinion 
that was voiced that went into the design of the horse finally ended up with a camel instead. And my biggest objection is these strains in the concrete, right? Even if you define the damage limits in rotation, in terms of the rotation, or even drift, interstory drift, do they always correspond to these strain limits? Or conversely, do these strain limits for collapse limit uh, or safety limit or immediate uh, occupancy limit always imply the corresponding um, drift? They don't always speak to each other. In fact, sometimes they seem to be unaware of one another. Another sobering and uh, somewhat humiliating experience, which I experienced personally, was this joint uh, IAEA uh, research that was uh, collaborate. That was where they collaborated with the Joint Research Center of the European um, Union, the European Research Center. Now, uh, some safety implications were observed. Uh, as a result of an earthquake that happened in Japan in, I forget the year now, uh, 2004 or something, in a place called Chuetsu. And uh, in spite of all the geological investigations that have been conducted prior to the licensing, construction, and operation of that nuclear plant, it was noticed in that year that a major fault existed nearby, and there was a magnitude six point something event that occurred. Now, was that a warning bell or could that have been weathered by the existing facility there? So the near field seismic motions represented a new dimension in the design of nuclear facilities, which are usually designed for far events, you know, uh, distant events. But what, what were the implications of this? So uh, experimental uh, research was conducted on this particular specimen on the shaking table in France, Saclay. And again, the same kind of uh, round robin con contest was conducted. The properties of the structure representing shear walls uh, were given to the contestants. And the question was asked, what are the measurements that I made? Uh, we entered this and we published our results in a paper. Uh, the, there were some 20 teams that entered this in the benchmark exercise. Uh, and there were contestants, participants from mostly nuclear countries. Although Turkey is not a nuclear, we don't have a nuclear plant, for instance. We entered this just to see if we could duplicate and predict the measurements that were made. And we carried this out by using the platform known as ANSYS. We came up with, we ended up with two different basic models. One, a three-dimensional representation of the experimental mock-up, the scaled mock-up. And the other one was a slice of that, representing only one of the two walls. And this was in the interest, of course, of computational ease. We tried, we modeled the boundary conditions as well as we did. And uh, we came up with the predictions of the quantities that were required. The, the, the benchmark contest was done in stages. Uh, they began with the, the elementary questions and then the questions or the parameters were made more and more complicated. First were the drifts, then we went to the curvatures. Then we went over to the overturning moments and local strains and the uh, floor response spectra and things of this kind. So it was made more challenging at every step of the way. This is one of the, uh, the results that we obtained at the beginning. 
what was the strength of the of the element of the um, the, the markup, the model, as a as a um, variable taking into account the displacements. Well, that the exercise wasn't all that bad. Uh, okay, these were our predictions, and the pushover tests. Where's the pushover test was right here. Uh, the ground, the the ground, the, the ground motion or the shake table motion. Of course, uh, when you have invested that much money on a specimen, you don't do only one test. You do a series of tests on that, beginning with the weak motions, going on to the more intense ground motions. And the intense ground motions were thought to be representative of near field ground motions. These were all scaled, of course, before they were applied to the specimen, but they were runs. So run number three began with the test structure having already experienced runs one and two. Run five was conducted on a specimen that had been subjected to four other tests prior to that time. In spite of that, the prediction of the drifts, the top displacement, for example, wasn't really all that bad, both in terms of the amplitudes and in terms of the periodicity of the motion, of the response as a function of the input motion. That wasn't too bad. That could be duplicated with some success, with some back or hindsight as well. Well, how about the crack patterns? Did our prediction of the cracking correspond with what had been marked on the specimen after the experiment? That also wasn't too bad, it was, but it was less successful than the top, um, top story displacement. Uh, one of the difficulties that we experienced that were experienced um, even by the experimenters themselves was that the successful recreation of near field events where higher frequency components are predominant. So it's very difficult to first squeeze the time by a factor of the square root of three, which is the scale factor here, and then to make it duplicate or mimic an already high frequency ground motion. So the, the limitations of the technology were also apparent there. Right, so this was a ground motion that was provided by Japan at distances of five and 11 kilometers to the recording site. And as you can see, the, the reduplication of the ground motion, the spectrum stood here, whereas the frequency was less than that because because of the existing prior damage on the on them. So uh, there's always a limitation to how well you can conduct the experiment, but you should always keep in mind the discrepancies that existed between the inputs and the intended result. Well, flow response spectrum on one of the one of the tests. Uh, well. The dark red is what was measured. The various other curves were what people predicted for it. A great deal of difference, isn't there? And this is, all of these teams are highly qualified individuals combining their talents and knowledge and experience into coming up with the required response. Well, not too well because the floor spectrum is a, an epitome of a local response. And if I can inject a, a measure, measure of self-praise, our team predicted this, which wasn't all that bad. But whether or not uh, we could come up with that on a completely different system is of course always um, open to debate. So uh, the, the summary of this, ladies and gentlemen, we can predict the overall response as you see here. 
but local response can only be estimated, back calculated, computed with limited success. Um, well, you know, I have roughly 400 more slides to go, so I beg for patience. Of course, that's not true. This is about the mid midway point in my presentation. Now, physical tests are fine. Physical tests are invaluable. Any theory without an experimental verification is worthless. But there's a limit to how many experiments you can do. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and uh, the, the experiment itself is not really the global answer to anything. So numerical experiments are also valuable because you can conduct these numerical experiments to any degree of refinement. You can conduct these experiments to any number of repetitions. You can vary as many parameters as you like, and you can change many things because it's ultimately a part of an experimental effort. So the physical tests should be done with that. And here's what we have uh, done and published in that paper. Right? A single wall was, was taken. Many parameters were changed in this. We change the wall width. Of course, the wall height was another parameter. We took the wall height to be the distance from the, uh, the centroid of the first mode distribution of the forces up to the, the foundation. Uh, the width ranged from three meters, five meters, and eight meters. The effective uh, shear span LV ranged from five to 24 meters, you know, a shift from a shear controlled to a flexure controlled range. The bound of element uh, reinforcement ranged from half percent to about 4%. And the wall axial ratio ranged from 2% to 50%, 50% being an extreme case, of course. And the reinforcement ratio in the two um, uh, web and and zones in this. Uh, the um, the warm, warm up tests, the warm up calculations indicated to us that whatever action took place here was really confined to the lower two limits. The top was elastic or cracked cross section. The action took place roughly here. So what we did was to save on the elements and the calculation of the response of the upper limits and to represent it by a shear, by a stiff beam and uh, to apply the force there and the axial force there and look at the response of the wall in the bottom two um, stories. What concrete model did we use? Uh, well, the Willem Wonke or Willem Wonke seems to do the, or seem to us at the time, uh, the best job of coming up with the variables that we want to see. Of course, there are other elements that are available in ANSYS, but the, that, that one was our best. I, I won't go into the details of this. Uh, so the material curves and the single strain limit were these. And uh, the model that we used for the strain, stra stress strain uh, modeling was the, the Sartjewel and Rosby model of whichever year it was. And for the steel, we took all of these, right? the, depending on the, um, the diameter of the bar, we took one of these, the bilinear curve. You know, the, the steel is really not all that important in its calculation. Well, here's the full wall, here's the model of it. And this is, um, there is, these, this is the summary of uh, various verification examples. This is where the action takes place. And we limited the plastic zone to a height each time equaling uh, one fifth of the wall thickness, of the wall width. 
Well, plane sections do not remain plane. That assumption that is the basis of the section analysis is really not all that true. So the implication of that is that if you try to calculate the local limit, the curvature, and the strains on the basis of the section analysis, you may be faced with a surprise. The cyclic behavior, well, it's not too bad. You can predict the strength and you can predict the cyclic behavior, the spindle shape of the hysteresis curve with some accuracy, but not all that much. Right. This is a specimen that we duplicated, we used as our benchmark model, the specimen by Thompson and Wallace, 1996, 25 years ago. Uh, well, you know, we can call this uh, limited, limited success. It's not all that bad. It's the local measures where we have the greatest discrepancy, all right? So the um, plane sections remaining plane, the classical assumption at two different limits of behavior or damage were here. And here are the measurements of the individual elements along the path. Difference exists between them. Um, performance limits governed by the axial load. Well, this is what we come up with. Again, these are all calculations. None of them has any experimental verification, right? Not too bad. The higher the axial load, the more brittle the component, as you see here. And drift limits, of course, are the best indication of that. Uh, as I pointed out to you, the, um, the plastic rotation is confined to the bottom 20% of the wall. And uh, we discovered that the limits that were specified by the Turkish regulation uh, are really not all that compatible with the section analysis. There's always a big if limited with that. Now, the number of variables, the number of combinations of those variables is uh, 300. So the graphs, the curves, uh, the artwork that I will show you from this point onwards will have many, many points to them. So uh, this is the range of variations. This shows the variations of the wall width, eight meters, five meters, three meters. And this shows its dependence on the unit shear in the element and the range of the plastic, plastic zone at the bottom as a percentage of the width of the wall. And again, you can see that there is no fixed number there. The plastic hinge depends on the unit shear. It depends on the wall width. So claiming this to be 20% of the wall width is not necessarily true. It can be more, it can be less. But if you use, again, this is you know, the, the result of curve fitting here. If you use this particular equation to all of these points, well, it doesn't turn out to be all that bad. Here is the, uh, the prediction, and here is the, the prediction on the basis of this equation and the prediction that we obtained from the set of numerical experiments, the end result of which was summarized here. Uh, even there, there is a great deal of um, scattered from the predictions. Well, how about the curvatures? Section analysis versus finite element. Vastly controlled again by the unit shear, as well as the width of the wall. Right? If things had been ideal, then we would have this horizontal line here, but real life, to the extent that we were able to imitate real life, showed us otherwise. Well, we compared these against other measures, against 
codified requirements. Right? The red lines here are the Turkish optimistic equations. Here's real life, real in quotation marks. Not so, it is not necessarily so. And our efforts for coming up with a better estimate resulted in these modified equations. What is this? Minimum damage, uh, life safety, and collapse prevention strain limits. Our range is, is this. You can see that, for instance, life safety just cannot be predicted in terms of the strains. It just does not work. And uh, the ultimate curvature capacities and quantities of similar nature here, right? Uh, the global yield, for instance, the ultimate. These cannot be tied to single numbers. If you increase the number of parameters that control the strain at ultimate to only a few of the possible controlling parameters, you must accept right from the beginning failure. And I will not dwell on this because they, all of these curves indicate the same limit. Then we uh, summarize them again. This is the drift, the curvature, the rotation, the concrete strain and the steel strain. The biggest scatter exists in the, uh, the local limit here. The drift even is controlled by that. So um, success is only a relative thing. It is not on the basis of these calculations predictable as far as we were able to conduct them. So we, we, here's our proposed improvements for the ASC limits. The black is the ASC limits for rotations and the reds are turned out to be our proposals. And here's a summary of them. And again, we fell prey to the same temptation of coming up with what are ultimately uh, predicted empirical equations. But the range of parameters that we came up with are more. We take into account the, uh, the end element reinforcement ratio, the confinement. We take into account the, uh, the axial load. We take into account the uh, the wall width and parameters of that kind, which are embedded in the ultimate plastic rotation. And if you do that, then the prediction does, does, does not turn out to be too bad. Now, I don't want to run over my allotted time, so I will quickly jump over the conclusions. I will actually repeat them. Uh, the accuracy in predicting the local measures is bad. The accuracy in predicting the more global measures is much better. I know that uh, there is a new version of ASC 41. I know also that there is to be a new version of your code eight, uh, part three. Has, has that been made public, Mujidar? As Do you know? The target date was 2020, but- it, Not it, yet, it, I've seen uh, the three, I haven't even seen the draft. I have seen the draft of EC8-1 and EC8-2 that were dated about middle February. And there is about a third of the table of contents, which is just blank in the, in the draft. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna take a while. Well, of course the pandemic must have something to do with that as well. Uh, uh, not, uh, I, I, uh, I assume so, yes. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, this is a self-criticism. The strain, the specification of strains in the concrete and the steel as indicators of performance or damage is really a premise that is weak to say the, to say the least, all right? And uh, your code hopefully will come up with a better description of performance limits that the next time it is out. Uh, so, so the plastic uh, rotations 
seem to be better indicators of performance. This is the path that ASC 41 takes. So I hope that I have not exhausted your patience uh, for this message. Uh, go global, young man, don't go local is my final word. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Paul, uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation and um, discussion on a very important topic. Uh, you haven't gone over time at all. Uh, you could have extended. This is not a problem, but um, I'm sure there will be some questions now where some of the uh, issues that you have raised uh, can be discussed. So with this, uh, I would like to open a floor, so to speak, e-floor for questions. Uh, so uh, please uh, go, go ahead, um, just unmute. I, I believe that uh, participants can unmute themselves I think it's better to ask a question in person rather than, uh -huh. I can see one question, one uh, hand, please uh, go ahead and ask. I think it is Tatiana. Well, good uh, afternoon. I, I'm Tatiana Isakovic from the University of uh, Ljubljana from Slovenia. And uh, I would like to thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I uh, like your conclusions very much <laughs> that uh, the uh, damage states should be measured by the global quantities, as you already mentioned, uh, because uh, to define uh, the curvature, to define the deformations, uh, we are not able to do that uh, very reliably uh, with the current models that we have. Because uh, I think there are many, many uh, parameters that influence the response. And one problem is also that you mentioned uh, that uh, the cross-section uh, doesn't remain plain after the deformation. And uh, that is uh, quite a large complication. Yes. Uh, and um, I would like to ask you something. You mentioned uh, that uh, uh, you, took into account uh, the influence of the slab uh, in your analysis, if uh, I understood well. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, uh, which uh, effective width of the slab should be taken into account uh, when uh, the walls are analyzed? Because uh, there are many different uh, results in the literature, yes, just, uh, what are your experiences and your opinion regarding this issue? Well, the, the role that the slab plays in the cyclic or, over, or pushover response of walls like this was not a parameter, but you're right, that could be made a parameter. The width of the, um, the slab here was what is required in the Turkish code, in the Turkish standard for reinforced concrete design, which is identical with the ACI 318. So mm -hmm. we did not take that into account, but I'm sure that a bare frame, a plain frame versus a frame, including the slab to different worlds will show differences in the response. But, you know, we had enough parameters to deal with as already, uh, as I already mentioned, so we did not make that an additional uh, concern. Okay, thank you. And probably you ask uh, uh, about the EC83, uh, the new version uh, is uh, completed. And uh, actually, um, the measurement of the different damage state is uh, the plastic uh, rotation. But um, what you probably wouldn't like uh, <laughs> the system, how to define uh, this rotation remain the same. The, the, the equations uh, are changed regarding the new uh, experiments that were av available and uh, uh, regarding the new database, but uh, in general, um, the system is the same, but uh, uh, 
uh, well, uh, the damage limitation state uh, is defined differently because uh, in the current Euro code uh, 8.3, um, it was defined uh, uh, multiplying the near collapse, uh, I mean, the rotation uh, uh, in the near collapse state was just multiplied by. Uh, 0.75 coefficient. Now this is changed because uh, this was not acceptable. Uh, it was improved, I think, uh, but the system uh, is uh, still uh, similar. <laughs> as anyway, I, 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 I belong to the global church and not to the local church. <laughs> no, no, but to the plastic rotation. Uh, I mean, uh, it is plastic not... Plastic rotation uh, is a good indicator. It yeah. doesn't depend on, on the displacement. It doesn't depend on the strain, but on, on, on the plastic rotation, which I think it is... Uh, I agree. Uh, ...positive. So, uh, yeah, and... Uh, uh, probably regarding this, uh, uh, this the cross section doesn't remain plain. Uh, do you have some suggestion how to how to take this into account that uh, uh, the section is curved uh, after the deformation? Do you have some suggestion uh, how to take into account uh, into our analysis? Well, for for everyday practice, uh, the assumption of plane sections remaining plain is really the only way we can go. Uh, you know, plane sections mm -hmm. not obeying that rule, the Van Uli, uh, violating the Van Uli principle is really more appropriate for research and not for everyday practice. And therefore not uh, suitable for uh, code requirements, Euro code requirements. Uh, make that assumption. At, at the end of the day, what saves, what dictates the performance of a structure is the detail, is the, um, the wisdom that goes into the detailing of the various elements. Who cares about what the strain was if the element maintains its integrity? Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Okay, thank you for, for, uh, for the presentation. Please, please, please give my regards to Peter and your colleagues in the Institute. Peter Pivar. Yeah, thank you. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, for very uh, uh, good questions. Uh, any more? We have um, quite a few people in the audience. Uh, any more questions? Uh, feel free to ask, um, be related to a talk or something. Extra, extrapolated, I said, uh, related to uh, Pollard's uh, great experience and uh, practice. Feel free to ask. Uh, just unmute yourself, please. Okay, maybe then if people are thinking, I have a question. Actually, it's question slash comment. Uh, first of all, regarding this uh, limit, strain limits in Canadian code, which you, as uh, you know, I've been practicing in Canada for the uh, last 25 years or so, it, the, the requirement is a check of for new, we have only for new buildings, it is the uh, rotational check. So that is the requirement for shear wall. So Canadian code for concrete is different than uh, American ACI. And we have been using it for the last, I would say, uh, I think it's since 2004 that requirement was there. But the rotation is determined based on uh, Bernoulli's hypothesis or strain sections remain plain because we have to come from, uh, from the curvatures and then uh, it's, it's, it's ultimately based on the strains. Uh, but the other question I have is now from the, let's say, Turkish practice or practice in countries where you, uh, like I would say even Serbian, um, in a sense it is similar. In the buildings that are of moderate height, if there is a sufficient amount of shear walls, we actually don't expect to come to the point of this just beyond one step to, 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 uh, to ambis uh, uh, with the shear walls. The shear walls are the elements that are um, expected to perform to a very relatively stiff and are not going to come to that stage. Uh, it's not the reason we shouldn't check them, but what do you think, let's say from the practice in Turkey with this 
buildings with frames where you add walls, hopefully initially or after um, when it is, uh, you know, after the earthquake. What do you think, uh, realistically, in most of the buildings, do shear walls come to the stage where we are really worried about that, uh, concerned about that state of uh, estimation? Or it is just an issue with tall buildings? <laughs> Well, medium height buildings, um, well, the poor performance or the collapse of medium height buildings will be impeded, will be arrested by the presence of walls. Walls are wonderful. They act like the safety fuses exactly. in an electrical system. Even if they are you know, badly detailed, even if they are you know, badly constructed, they still uh, work wonders in limiting the drift. The moment you've been successful in limiting the drift, you have solved more than half of the problem. It may suffer damage and so on. So a, a, a wall is a wonderful element. In tall buildings, where they are more like cantilevers and so on, I, uh, we, first of all, we did not try that. You know, our uh, numerical tests did not go that far. But uh, I, I keep seeing, well, even in my city, many tall buildings with shear walls, but the slenderness ratio, that is the height divided by the width of the wall, uh, approaching 12 or 15 or ratios of that kind, you know, it leads me to wonder what the response of these will be if those buildings should be subjected to ground motions. And I think, uh, apart from the experience in Chile, we don't really have much of a uh, much of a, a database to go on that. And the performance in, in the Chilean buildings, of course, were contaminated by the failure of the foundations, you know, because the yielding took place not in the ground level, not at the, you know, the foundation level, but at the top of the second level or something because of detailing differences. I am not really familiar with what they did in uh, New Zealand um, where they did have shear walls in those tall buildings in the center of Christchurch. Um, I, I think that, again, uh, the building that collapsed, the radio building that collapsed, did have shear walls, didn't it? But there was some discontinuity in them. I yeah, I agree with you. And um, a comment regarding Chilean buildings and Chile, the 2010 Chile earthquake was an example of an earthquake that exposed tall buildings, relatively tall buildings with shear walls. And as you say, uh, they did not perform well. I went to Chile after the earthquake and I think their detailing practice was according to really an outdated version of uh, ACI. And uh, the, they had lots of issues with the reinforcement and with the wall thickness and all that. So I think the even though the buildings were tall, relatively tall, 20 stories or so, there is a, a good explanation. It's not just this calculation of rotations or whatever check to uh, to check the damage limits. It is more very basic, much more basic the reason that these walls did not perform. And coming to that question of detailing, the, on this slide that we can see, I can see a detailing uh, elements uh, or the um, arrangement in the shear walls. Uh, I assume this, this is not necessarily Turkish practice, but I'm, my question is, uh, given that you do have now a lot of shear walls in practice, is this a common detailing practice to have embedded uh, boundary elements in the walls or you're going for, uh, or it is more common to have this, what we call barbell sections with the shear walls? What is the common practice for shear walls that's actually really- uh, Well, as of 1998, all shear walls must have the boundary element. That is, you can't, you can't build them otherwise. But this is, is it embedded like this one? Because these embedded, are- Yes. Well, it can, it can have a barbell shape or it can be embedded, but there needs to be an end element. Okay, that's that's what I want. So, 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 the, did did 1999 earthquakes exposed any shear walls that were having that were without boundary elements? Uh, because I guess that they were you know existing, pre-existing, or there were no 
really good uh, examples of shear walls exposed to the 1999 earthquakes, which were particularly strong in Turkey? Well, in the, in the, in the 1999 experience, uh, I will make a gross uh, division here, gross uh, classification. Buildings, decently designed, engineered buildings that had shear walls, suffered no collapse or uh, intolerable da damage, even in Gölcük, which was sitting right on the fault itself. And I, I wish I'd put this uh, here, but there's a building you know, no more than 200 meters away from the, the fault line, the exposed fault line, maybe five or six stories, shear walled, nothing happened to it. There were other, many other cases and walls and uh, buildings that lacked walls behaved terribly in general. And those pictures of collapsed buildings, those pancake buildings are still fresh in the minds of, of the profession in this country that deals with earthquake design, earthquake resistant design. So uh, that's, that's why the provision was brought in 1999 that you need to have, if you have a wall, anything that you can call a wall, you need to have the boundary element. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, any more questions from the audience, please? I, I, I hope yes. you have some more time in case there are questions. So here is Nicola, do you want to ask questions? Yes, I would like to ask uh, Professor Gulkan on what is your opinion on using RC walls in retrofitting gun reinforced masonry structures? Do you think it's a good idea or, or not? You mean a, a retrofit measure? A shear wall is a retrofit measure, measure like the one I showed you, like this one? Yes, so do you think they should be used in unreinforced masonry structures? If we have an old existing masonry structure, should we, for example, remove a masonry wall and put in an RC wall, or should we use some other retrofitting techniques? Well, you know, that, that, can, can, serve, that can serve as an invitation to other problems at the slab level, unless you have a strong enough girder beam on which the slab sits, removing masonry walls and replacing them by these uh, shear wall elements, panels, if you like. It requires a, quite a bit of uh, you know, anchoring them to the levels above and below. I think that it may not be all that feasible. So replacing them by strong, stronger masonry walls might be a better alternative. Okay, so you would avoid inserting reinforced concrete walls inside older yep. unreinforced masonry structures. Thank you. Yes, that's 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 my opinion. No. Thank you, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, any any more questions? Well, thank you very much. I, I really would like to thank all 40 people who were present at one time during my talk and the, the, the Serbian National Association for Earthquake Engineering for making this event possible. Uh, well, let's keep this up. I mean, you know, I, I hope that this will set a, a, a tradition uh, that will enable remote contact. Yes, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give uh, the talk. It was very interesting and uh, relevant uh, for, uh, for our practice in Serbia and uh, neighboring uh, countries. Um, yeah, there were people from, I, I, I believe, um, also Bosnia, Slovenia, and uh, I think even one colleague from India was there. So it was more, we don't have a list, uh, we don't have registration, but I are recognized by the name. So, Thank you so much, Paulat. Uh, everything was perfect. If you don't mind, we will uh, post this and I'll let you know before that on the website of uh, Susie and um, uh, contact you regarding that. And for those, for the others, we have a next talk in the end of May. It is going to be about seismic hazard in Serbia and 
of the West, Western Balkans by uh, the mm -hmm. Professor uh, Borko Kumai. Will this be in English or Serbian? Serbian, yeah. Most of our talks are in Serbian, except, is, yeah. if, except if the guest is of course, English speaking. So I believe that uh, when uh, Professor Pfeiffer uh, gave a talk, he uh, he spoke in English, even though I mean he understands Serbian. So it depends if how people feel more comfortable. But mostly, um, most talks are in Serbian. So, but you're most welcome. We can put you on a list. So if you are interested in any talk, you can test your Serbian. We have a number of Turkish words in our <laughs> language, so maybe you can get through and interpolate between those. Uh, so thank you very much and thanks to uh, all participants for uh, for being here and uh, keep uh, keep going uh, so we have a uh, we have a uh, thank you from uh, Serbia so thank you from from colleague from India for giving opportunity to hear the webinar so thank you all and uh, have a good evening and uh, thank you Paul we will be in touch uh, I, I wish everybody well and hope that uh, these remote contacts will disappear one day soon Good evening, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.